Buy-siders and bankers are optimistic headed into the third quarter as the markets are rewarding positive catalysts and companies can finance their pipelines on the back of good news. But there's still uncertainty, and that's because it's unclear just when the Fed might cut interest rates, and that is keeping a lid on how far the optimism for biotech can extend. We'll discuss BioCentury's third quarter public markets preview on the BioCentury This Week podcast. We'll also discuss the latest from Washington, FDA appropriations, and the Biosecure Act. Plus, biotech has lost a legend in Lisa Burns. I'm Jeff Cranmer, one of the executive editors here at BioCentury, and joining me today to discuss all of this are my colleagues. Simona Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Stephen Hansen, Director of Biopharma Intelligence. And Steve Usden, Washington Editor. Simone, I'll bet you never agreed more with me than today that football begins in September, is played with an oblong ball, lots of pads and a helmet, and has endless stoppages in play. Tough weekend. Well, tough weekend uh, for England supporters, but I've already apologized over and over to my children for giving them this burden, which is the burden of an English person in the last, what is it, 60 years or something like that, nearly 60 years, 58. And so, you know, we pick ourselves up and we dust ourselves off and then we, you know, get all excited about the the World Cup and we spend a couple of years deciding whether Gareth Southgate should still be manager. But, you know, other things happen like Wimbledon, for example, where we had a very delightful result. So there you go. We never feel sad about the uh, the Joker getting bounced, uh, though he is coming off surgery. So I suspect we'll see more of him. But if you do want to try American football, Stephen and I both have uh, two teams to offer up to you. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings and the Philadelphia Eagles. Both are always in it. They never let you down. And uh, <laughs> I, I think you'd fall in love as an English fan. Uh, what do you think, Stephen? Well, I, I think the Vikings are almost the equivalent of the English uh, football team in that they uh, they can take you far, but they never get you over the top. So uh, I, I have some sympathy from that respect, for sure. All right. Well, let's dig into some finance here, Stephen. Uh, we've just published your public markets preview for which you spoke to bankers and buy-siders. What's the mood headed into the second half of the year? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So, you know, I think that really kind of depends on how you're feeling about the current market depends kind of on your perspective. So kind of from from the investor perspective, you know, they, they were actually pretty quite happy, actually, because it was essentially a stock pickers market, you know, um, positive news gets rewarded, negative news sends the stock down, but sentiment's not really either really terrible, you know, grim and down. But on the flip side, it's also not overhyped and really frothy. So, you know, they, they were actually pretty, pretty happy, pretty content with where the market is, you know, as it stands right now. For companies, you know, <laughs> how are you feeling probably is wholly dependent on what your balance sheet looks like. Um, companies with a positive catalyst, you know, have been able to raise money pretty easily in the second uh, second quarter and sort of here going forward. But those that don't have a near term sort of milestone, but do have a financing need, I mean, they're in a bit of a bit more of a tough spot. You know, they're either kind of, you know, feeling a bit anxious about having to wait maybe to raise, a, 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 you know, on the back of their milestone and maybe push their cash runways to the limit, or they might have to take it on the chin in terms of price if they want to do an opportunistic financing. But as you mentioned in the opener, you know, it's kind of overarching all of this is this kind of macroeconomic situation where right now, all that really means is interest rates. And, you know, the perspective on this really depends on what the Fed is willing to do. And that can change <laughs> kind of from day to day and, and minute to minute. A week ago, investors and bankers were expecting biotech to have to kind of fight kind of a bit of an uphill battle like, because expectations were that, you know, interest rates, they were really diminished on, on when they might come and if there was even going to be a, an interest rate cut this year. And that actually changed a lot last Thursday. You know, we had better than expected June inflation data. And then 
You saw a bunch of economic analysts come out, you know, all arguing that that was strong evidence that the Fed could use that to support an interest rate cut in September. We saw the XBI jump two and a half percent on that news. Um, the Magnificent Seven, you know, the big stocks all kind of fell on expectations that there might be a rotation out of these names and into sort of higher risk, small and mid cap equity stories. So there's kind of a bit of renewed optimism that, you know, the risk on trade could be back in September. So it really kind of all hinges on kind of what happens with interest rates. You know, I guess what, the question is really whether biotech can manage its own version of a soft landing, Stephen. As we've said over and over, echoing or channeling everything we hear, it's really all about data. You've got to have data and you've got to have good data. And what you reported in the story is that there's a, you know, the risk on risk off is whether people will invest in anticipation of a catalyst yep. or whether they will hold off on those allocations to see how the data read out, be prepared to take a little bit less of, a, of an upside and get in afterwards. But what, what we're hearing echoed is we do not, or the, the ecosystem does not want to go back to the sort of heady days where you could get massive financings without data. And we will see in terms of soft landing how long that discipline stays. Because, yeah. you know, I and, mean, you know to, just to make one more point, we have seen, and I'm not going to name names, people can look it up. We've seen some very, very big financings for private companies that are platform companies long in advance of anything remotely like data. So mm. there's still some exuberance, should we say, over big names and things. That's not yeah. a judgment, it's just a fact. That's right. No, I mean, you're right. And investors are being more selective. And, you know, I think, again, it was sort of, you know, at the start of the year, we had just had the Fed, you know, have a much more um, sort of dovish outlook on the interest rate cuts that were going to be coming in 24. And on the back of that, you know, people got really aggressive with their allocations. And as you said, they were looking to get in ahead of catalysts so that they could try and really capture all of the upside of that coming data event. And, you know, what we saw in the second quarter, when a lot of those expectations about interest rates went down and sort of the risk on trade went away, is you had people basically saying, well, I can wait for that data and then I can buy in the aftermarket. And yeah, I might only get 50% of the upside that I might have gotten if I'd gotten in ahead of it. But you're getting a much more de-risked asset and you're still, you know, there was still some upside to be had. So I think that kind of dynamic will probably continue through the rest of the year, but it will be driven by what expectations are around those interest rates. Steven, uh, what's the outlook for IPOs? Yeah, so, you know, it's been pretty poor. I mean, I guess it's relative to, to the year. I mean, it's obviously been better this year than it was last year in a bear market. Um, but it's not been great in terms of, you know, how the IPOs have been performing in the aftermarket. But um, again, you know, I think it really all turns on what the expectations are for that risk on mentality. You know, I think if there is an actual cut in September, you could start to see companies that were sort of this summer thinking, well, we'll wait till 2025 when that risk on mentality might be back and they were going to hold off. That's what a lot of the bankers were saying is that some of the big sort of more high profile names were going to wait till 2025. But if you get that cut in September and that trade starts coming back, it's possible that they could be trying to set up for a October, maybe post-election sort of IPO window, potentially. You know, it, it's a lot of this is really driven by that macro, which kind of makes it uh, makes it interesting, but also makes it a little difficult to predict. Well, I think there's one thing that is a fairly safe space to talk about, which is m and I mean, all of the indications from every angle are that m and is going to continue to be quite robust. That's I right. personally, from what we're hearing, don't think that's so subject to the, like, even if the interest rates come down um, in what would it be the third quarter and the IPO market picks up. We know that farmers are on the hunt. And we also know, as I think Otello from Omega Funds pointed out, that they are soon, and he's not the only one, of course, they're soon running out of these uh, late stage assets and are going to need to start moving early stage. And we are seeing that also in deal flow when we look by the numbers. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's only so many sort of independent, you know, wholly owned phase three assets that farmers can can buy up. And I think a lot of those have been have been picked, as we saw from like, you know, the Cerebells and the Karuna, you know, type of deals that we saw at the end of last year. And so, yeah, I think it'd be interesting, obviously, from an investor perspective, you know, I think they, they would be quite interested to see farmers moving earlier as well. 
get some returns on some of those uh, some of those early early stage investments that they're you know that they're interested in. All right. Well, Stephen's story is up on our website. You can find a link in the show notes. Uh, you can also go to biocenturypodcast.com to find that one. We'll be back after a quick break. This September in Nashville, BioCentury launches Grand Rounds, a new interdisciplinary R&D forum at the interface of industry and academia. Join BioCentury in a rich roster of innovators and key thought leaders to identify leading edge discoveries and discuss urgent challenges that must be solved to translate these innovations into product development and medical practice. Meet academic innovators, physician scientists, early stage investors, and biopharma R&D leaders for two days of networking, partnering, and debate. Register at biocentrygrandrounds.com. Okay, and we are still accepting nominations for a limited number of open slots for companies to present. We're looking for companies that are ideally pre-seed, seed, or series A, early in development, with ties to academia, and eager to share their vision and future plans. Uh, that's the recipe that we're looking for for Grand Rounds companies. Simone, we're also uh, looking for companies that want to present posters. Quick word there. Yeah, just to make a point, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, Grand Rounds, of course, is in Nashville cool place from September 9th to 11th. Yes, we are featuring posters as well. So for companies and researchers that aren't quite ready to pitch to investors with an oral presentation, or even if they are, and they want to actually double down and get more visibility for their work because the poster stands there the whole time, we invite you to present a poster and Jeff, you're going to put some links in the show notes, are you, for how? Yeah, people- I, I, I will indeed. We're, gonna, will we're indeed. not going to sit here and read out URLs, are we? No, well, I'm so good at that, but uh, yeah. yeah, we will uh, pop a link right in the show notes, and uh, you can also go to our website and track down whatever you need. Or if you're a company that wants to present, wants to learn more, feel free to reach out directly to me via LinkedIn or other means. Let's head to Washington. Steve, I'm so sorry to say my eyes start to glaze over when you say the words FDA appropriations on our morning editorial call. It's sort of like back when you were a kid and your mom's like, eat your broccoli. You know, you know, it's good for you, but uh, not so tasty. But uh, hey, um, I'm me or you. Uh, Tell us what you found. Yeah, I like broccoli. You know, you can you can make it good. (laughs) <laughs> so look, the appropriations bills, uh, there's one in the House, there's one in the Senate. From FDA standpoint, they're bad and they're awful. The Senate um, version is bad. It's a modest increase in spending and spending ability that doesn't come close to covering the costs of salary increases and new mandates. And the House version, which cuts $22 million from the FY24 budget, is even worse for FDA. It's important to note that most of the funding for drug reviews is unaffected because it comes from user fees, but the taxpayer or baseline funding for FDA is nonetheless important because user fees don't pay for everything FDA does that is important to drug development and especially not everything that's important for public health. The other thing though, and I wrote about this in a story that's really fascinating about the appropriations process are the reports that appropriations committees give that that they publish in conjunction with their the numbers that they've allocated for FDA. These reports don't have the force of law, but FDA pays very close attention to them and usually tries to comply with the requests in their reports. Nobody wants to piss off the people who write their checks. There's one thing in the House report this year that FDA will, I think, will try to shrug off if Biden is reelected. The report calls for FDA to drop its plans to regulate laboratory-developed tests, If Trump is elected, I think that rule will never go into effect. The reports also give a glimpse behind the curtain at Capitol Hill lobbying. If you've ever wondered what the money that goes to lobbyists pays for, read the appropriations bill reports. One example in the FDA reports, the House and the Senate reports both urge FDA to get moving with regard to working with DEA to deschedule DORA drugs for insomnia. The reports don't spell out what DORA means, And I would be shocked 
if the members of the Appropriations Committee could tell you what DORA is. But readers of Bicentury know, because I wrote about it in September 2023, dual orexin receptor antagonists. The report language is a result of a push from a company called Adorsia to change the DEA scheduling for DORAs, which could dramatically increase usage of its insomnia drug. And in fact, the company's made a good case for descheduling, arguing that its drug doesn't have abuse potential and that it's far safer than insomnia drugs that are widely prescribed off-label. That, of course, is a fairly prominent European company uh, run by the Clozels, who used to be behind Actilion. Um, Steve, was there anything in there about accelerated approval? Yeah, there's several things in there about accelerated approval. Okay, one is there's this kind of odd language in the appropriations reports urging FDA to consider survivability as an endpoint for accelerated approval of ALS. And you may wonder what, what that's about. What that is about is a company called Clean Nanomedicine, which has been lobbying FDA and Congress to urge FDA to allow it to use a demonstrated association between neurofilament reduction and increased survival in ALS as an endpoint for an application that it plans to um, submit very soon. More generally, I'd say the reports really show strong congressional support for FDA's use of regulatory flexibility, including an accelerated approval to approve drugs for rare diseases. Okay, let's turn to Biosecure, Steve. At least on the surface, it seems to me to have taken a bit of a back seat in recent weeks to other issues that we've been following. But uh, you wrote last week that the bill, which seeks to rein in the operations of Chinese contract manufacturing companies and genomics companies, their activities in the U.S., that is, uh, it's begun gaining momentum. What's happening? So Speaker Johnson gave a speech about, about the U.S. rivalry or competition with China last week, and he vowed to bring the Biosecure Act for a floor vote in the House before year end. That got a lot of attention. But the real action, which didn't get so much attention, except perhaps from um, subscribers to BioCentury that read our coverage of it, was in the Senate. Uh, Biosecure has been proposed as an amendment to the FY25 defense bill, the NDAA. You might remember its supporters wanted to get Biosecure into the House version of the NDAA, but it was rejected because it wasn't germane. The Senate works differently, so it's quite possible that Biosecure could be included in its version of the bill. If it did make it into the final version, then it's quite likely that the House would okay that. The timing on voting on the bill and on the amendments on the bill isn't clear, but I think it's most likely to happen after the elections. Interestingly, and this is something that BioCentury predicted, the Senate is not considering the Senate version of the Biosecure Act. It's considering the House version of the bill. And this is much better for um, biopharma companies. It has an eight-year grandfathering for contracts in place when the bill becomes law, and the language that clearly limits its applicability to specific kinds of government contracts, which seems to mean that it won't apply to Medicare or to Medicaid, and that it wouldn't affect contracts for discovery or clinical research. All right. Thanks for that, Steve. Uh, again, uh, head to the show notes. You'll see a link to Steve's coverage. Lisa Burns passed away a couple of weeks ago. We here at BioCentury, and I know many, many others across the biopharma industry, are grieving her loss. Gone too soon, of course. Um, everyone knew Lisa. Back in the early 1990s, when biotech really began to just get going, at that time, you could really fit all the key players, the companies, in one room. Uh, people like Fred Frank, George Rathman, Brooke Byers, Lisa ran in that crowd. And essentially, she was the pioneer of IRPR for biotech. She connected investors with companies. She was the web that sort of connected everyone in industry. And of course, you can't talk about Lisa without mentioning her fabulous party at H&Q, uh, later JP Morgan, a top Neiman Marcus in the rotunda. Everyone I spoke to for 
my remembrance of Lisa, which will be out in a couple of days, everyone to a person just remembered stepping out of the elevator and being greeted with a kiss on the cheek by Lisa wearing a fabulous dress. And um, just another couple of points to add uh, fabulous dress, fabulous events, indeed. But I think it's also worth thinking about in those early days of biotech, Lisa was one of actually a few women. There were women bankers and, you know, some prominent other women financers who really actually had outsized influence in the industry in the very early days. And I believe that, you know, she is one of the people who sort of brought the whole idea of IRPR to these nascent CEOs who didn't really necessarily come from a world that was trained in that. It was a very, uh, you know, fledgling industry. And I think that people have such fun memories. You don't normally think about that with communication people, but she really brought that to the industry and scaled it in a way that created connections among people. And our industry is, of course, really built on connections. I think the other thing that's really important and, and interesting is that anybody who's watched the, the biotech industry for, for any period of time realizes that it's extraordinarily volatile. There's a roller coaster. Virtually every company that's successful had a point in time when it, it looked like it was going to go belly up. Every drug that has become really successful and helped a lot of people had to get through a, a patch where it looked like it just was going to fail. And what's been really critical to making the industry successful and to navigating this, these ups and downs has been the relationship between companies and their investors and the relationship between companies and the public. And that's the kind of relationship and, and understanding how to navigate those relationships and the importance of it is, I think, the legacy, if you want to call it that, that Lisa Burns created. Well said. A lot of the folks I, I talked to uh, really uh, pointed that out. I mean, we have such a strange industry in that there can be failure after failure after failure. And then that leads to the aha moment that brings you an amazing drug. And what Mary Tanner told me was that Lisa really had a good nose for which companies would emerge from failure. If there was a disaster to control, she was the go-to person when something terrible happened, whether it was a clinical flop or a regulatory setback. Uh, Richard Pops, the longtime head of Al Kermes, who uh, worked with her from way back in the day, he said, you know, she knew how to deal with those complex issues. Uh, Franklin Berger, who shared an office with her for a number of years, he was the top biotech analyst in the 1990s. He said, sometimes disasters open another door. And when those disasters happen, those were the moments when industry and CEOs look to her more than any other person. A light has gone out in biotech, but the number of people that she touched and influenced and mentored, they all really carry, carry a little part of her. I feel really privileged to have spoken to so many people that knew her so well over the past few days. So I, I'm looking forward to sharing that with you all. Well, last week on our sister podcast, just wanted to let you know before we go, uh, Steve, you talked to John O'Brien. What did you learn? So John O'Brien is the president and CEO of the National Pharmaceutical Council. It's a think tank that's funded by the pharmaceutical industry. And John's really interesting. He's, he's one of the smartest people around, and he's also had a variety of, of interesting experiences, right? He was the kind of the drug pricing czar in um, HHS during the Trump administration. He's been at Blue Cross Blue Shield, at CMS during Democratic administration, and at Pharma. We talked about a lot of things. It's worth listening to um, to the interview. He talked a lot about some of the unintended consequences of the Inflation Reduction Act, and not just the drug pricing provisions that people think about, but also the ways that the restructuring of Part D may and almost certainly will push payers to try to limit access to the most expensive and, and some of the most important drugs that, that patients need. We, we talked about that. We talked about a lot of other things. It's really worth a listen. All right. 
Links to all the stories we discussed today can be found in the show notes or by going to biocentrypodcast.com. The John O'Brien podcast, uh, Spotify, Apple. If you want the video, you can go to our YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in. Steven and Simone will be running the show the next couple of weeks. I'll be off in the great state of New Jersey, eating cheesesteaks, going to Eagles training camp, and of course, the Jersey Shore. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for BioCentury this week. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education.